As lead singer of Queen, Freddie Mercury sold an incredible 150 million albums. I am completely pantomime compared with his voice and him as, a, as, a, as an entertainer. Theatricality, larger than life, new, fresh, cool. This is a, is a god that walks as man. Off stage, he was fiercely private, never publicly discussing his upbringing in India as Farrakh Bulsara. He couldn't have become a pop star if he hadn't passed for white. His homosexuality? They were all had to have meat on them. That was Freddie's look, truckers. <sighs> or the truth about his outrageous lifestyle. He was just hedonistic, I mean completely hedonistic. Most of the stuff I do is pretending, it's like acting. You know? So you go on stage and I pretend to be a macho man. He was radically different to the public persona. The public persona was something he'd put on like a jacket. Um, he was shy. This month, Freddie would have turned 60 years old. I've lived a full life, and if I'm dead tomorrow, yeah. I'm going to be dead. <laughs> Just who was the man behind the magic? Magic, 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 magic! Oh, he was interested in any kind of music. Ever since he was a little boy at home, he didn't matter. It, imagination was wide. He used to listen to quite a lot of rock and roll kind of music on um, English stations on the radio. And then he used to sing around with his friends. You know, that, that told us that he had some talent in that. When I first knew Freddie, he sounded like a sheep. Um, it was a sort of powerful, controlled bleat and uh, he fashioned himself into this incredibly powerful singer. The difference between Freddie and almost all the others rock stars, the difference is that he was having a voice. His voice was like a machine gun. It hit everything perfectly. One thing that we found out now from covering, you know, Queen song, I mean, they're just so difficult to sing. <laughs> Is this the real life? Songwriting-wise, it's just one of those people that's just, you know, complete genius. Is this just fantasy? How do you write a song like Bohemian Rhapsody? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. Where did that come from? How did you open your mind up and put the net out to capture all of those lyrics and that melody and those changes and those backing vocals? I hate actually trying to analyse my songs to the full. It's like people still ask me what Bohemian Rhapsody is about, and I say, I don't know. Because I think it, 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 it loses the myth, and it, it sort of... It, it actually sort of um, ruins a, a kind of um, imagination or whatever, or something that people have built up. I think we'll go with a little Bohemian Rhapsody, gentlemen. Good call. The whole Bohemian Rhapsody sequence in Wayne's World happened because that is what we used to do uh, in Toronto when Bohemian Rhapsody would come on. Everybody had their part to play. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo. 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 Galileo.
success of the scene is is 100% the song. I mean, no song, no scene. And Freddie was so influential to my whole core. Oh, mama mia, mama mia, mama mia, let me go. Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me, for me. I do remember filming that scene, and my neck was killing me for about a year. Queen were one of the most successful studio bands ever, but it was Freddie's live performances that were to become legendary. As soon as he stepped on the stage, he commanded whatever stage he was on. He understood what an audience wanted. He knew that it wasn't all about sucking up to them, it was about actually insulting them, but it, on a sort of friendly level, you know, with a glint in his eye. I'm going to make you sing, sing like Aretha Franklin, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I... oh. Right, you can join the band. In 1985, Freddie gave what many consider to be the ultimate live performance. I couldn't get over the size of the audience, first of all. And then when Freddie came and did his bit, as though, as though he was so used to all that. Queen came on, I remember just being blown away. I thought they completely stole the show. All we hear is Radio Gaga, Radio Guru, Radio Gaga, all we hear. The sound on stage was so awful. We just sort of put our heads down and battered our way through uh, the 17 minutes. I think everybody agreed with me that their show was the best. I just couldn't take my eyes off him and thinking, goodness, what has he done? He has done, he's proved himself. When Freddie gets on stage and puts his arm out and he puts the head back and the microphone in his hand, you know, he's being... Um, it's its like a, a plate of armour, really. I mean, if you saw him on stage and you saw him off stage, I mean, back home or whatever, you think, it's not the same person. Quite a lot of people, when they meet me, they're quite um, disillusioned, the fact that they, they expect me to actually just do what I do on stage, and I'm, I'm a human being, you know, and I'd, li I'd like people to realize the fact that I'm a human being. Oh, yes, I'm the great pretender Pretending I do it well I think Freddie Mercury was a constructed um, chimera, a fabulous bird on whose back was born the ambitions of Farouk Bulsara. Oh, yes, I'm the great he wouldn't have been able to create the image if you give everybody the bald fact about your life. There is no mystery, there's no mystique, there's nothing left to hide behind. One of the facts that Freddie was keen to keep secret from the public was his homosexuality. I think Freddie might have been a bit um, ashamed about the fact that he was gay um, and the fact that the way we were brought up. That upbringing involves strict adherence to Zoroastrianism, an ancient religion that forbids homosexuality. Freddie didn't actually sit down and discuss his sexual life uh, with us as a family, but it wasn't a secret either. So we knew that um, he was gay, but that didn't bother me at all. Oh, yes, I'm 
Freddie was totally committed to Queen. If you take that as your starting off point, you will realize why Freddie did not leap up and down and wave pink flags, not that he was that sort of person anyway. The industry didn't like it. And of course, they were making, they were about to make an awful lot of money and to continue to make an awful lot of money. And so the record company would not want Freddie to come out and say, well, I'm actually gay. It was because of this commercial pressure that Freddie was so reluctant to speak to the media. He rarely gave an interview to the music press or to the national press because he didn't trust them. He didn't trust them. I mean, I was lucky from that point of view. I mean, he did trust me. Do you have a relationship now or are you Yes, that is a very now? careful. We have to be very careful. I can put this way. I'm so happy with the person I'm living with at the moment. That's it. Yeah, are you happy about me saying that and obviously that is a male relationship? No, no, you mustn't. You mustn't that's what say I that. No. no, you want it to be. I just said relationship. Relationship. No, that's exactly okay. what I said. Yeah. Throughout his life, Freddie refused to publicly acknowledge that he was gay. The positive aspects had he come out as gay, certainly in the 70s and the early 80s, for gay men like me who could see no role models for ourselves would have been immensely helpful. I feel very disappointed that he couldn't bring himself to do it. Well, maybe I have a wider sexual taste than most people. But I mean, that's as far as I want to go into actually sort of come up with saying I'm gay. It's sort of, to be honest, a bit beneath me. Coming up in part two, we trace Freddie's roots back to India. Freddie Mercury was born on the African island of Zanzibar, but his family had lived in India for generations. It was a background he was always reluctant to talk about. I sometimes used to tease him and say he came from India, and he didn't like that at all. I think he did play it down a bit, yeah, uh, because I think he saw it as something that people wouldn't quite equate with rock and roll. Although he spent his infant years at home, Freddie was sent to boarding school in India at the age of seven. Freddie realised that mum and dad did it for his own good because he knew that if he'd have stayed in Zanzibar, there wasn't that much of a choice of education. At first time, he thought it was an adventure, something new. And uh, he took it very easily. In case he didn't cry, it was me who cried leaving him there. <laughs> Freddie and myself, we shared many years in the school. Our school was absolutely, I would put in one word, all right, perfect. The way we sat, the way we ate, and the way we dressed, the way we polished our shoes, the way we had a haircut, everything was perfect. What is the function of the nucleus? What is it called? Cell division. What is Cell division. Cell division. Okay. The second function? This is one of the dormitories of St. Peter's where we boys, Freddie and myself, we slept. As a young boy, he felt very lonely and uh, would, in a quiet corner, sometimes cry. He was homesick. Of course he missed us, but I think it showed him he had to cope. Um, whatever problems he had, he had to try and solve it. He was happy at school. And he fitted in very well. Even in his sport, he got a trophy at his school. But music was his best thing. Mama, just killed a man. Put a gun against his head. Pull my trigger now he's dead. I'm shocked and I'm very happy. Shocked because this is what is left of the old piano which Freddie and myself played, and happy that I could actually touch it. It brings fond memories for me. I was amazed at the way he plays this piano. I knew this is going to be the making of Freddie Balsara.
at that time when we were growing up, I didn't know Freddie would grow up to be a gay guy. It must be very difficult for him to cope up with us while we were chasing girls. I don't wonder, I still wonder what was going in his mind. When you realize what it is you are and you realize that you cannot exist in a world where you are not comfortable, it's a hell of a spur to get out of that world and find a world that you are comfortable in. In 1964, Freddie left India and the revolution in Zanzibar forced the Bulsaras to look for a new home. Young Freddie persuaded them to move to a different world, Feltham on the outskirts of London. When we arrived, of course, England, to my eyes, was totally different. I've never seen anywhere like this before. I suppose it was all what he was looking for. He had more choices here. I want to break free. I want to break free. I want to break free from your lies. You're so self-satisfied, I don't need you. Freddie spent much of the next decade studying at art school and struggling to establish himself as a musician. In 1971, he and three friends formed Queen and shortly afterwards, he discovered that even more choices were opening up to him. He had his huge hit in 1975 with Bohemian Rhapsody. They then started making a name for themselves all over the world and everything became that much easier to, to get. Everything was achievable. And it also was letting him out of his sexual cage. Have you had many affairs? I have had more, <laughs> I have had more lovers than Liz Taylor, dear. <laughs> you have to remember the touring. And after doing a show like he would do, you can't go to bed, so you go out to the bars. And he invariably found someone to go back with. They were all had to have sort of meat on them. That was Freddie's look, truckers. <laughs> he was just hedonistic, I mean, completely hedonistic. Freddie's outrageous character inspired him to host a string of legendary parties. Freddie loved to party. His motto was, life is for living, and he would spend a fortune on a party. The idea was really just to have fun and sort of blow people's minds a bit with the excessiveness. The atmospheres were just fantastic because everybody enjoyed themselves. I mean, the food, the champagne flowed, anything you wanted was there. He was a most generous host, very generous. There was a party at the Roof Gardens. All the staff, were naked, but they were all body painted. You know, you, you just did not know what you were seeing. In London, he had a hat party. We're all in funny hats, big hats, and some people had hats with corkscrews and things, and it was just a fantastic thing. I remember one party in Munich. It was a black and white ball, and Freddie flew us all over on a, on a private uh, jumbo that he'd hired, and we all had to wear black and white drag. It ended up a bit like a Roman orgy in the end. A lot of those stories are grossly exaggerated, Mother. You know, the sex, drugs and rock and roll stories. No, actually, the, the dwarves with cocaine. Wow, I don't know where that came from. It's a wonderful image. You know, you can just imagine, it's just the right height, walking around, just getting... <laughs> I never actually saw any dwarfs with coke. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know where that myth came from, but um, they were pretty outrageous. And the naked mud wrestlers, I'll give you that one. We had quite a lot of those. This was all part of the excess. Tonight, I'm gonna have myself a real good time. Freddie's love of excess hit its peak when he moved to New York in the early 80s a period of gay liberation before anyone had heard of HIV. I suppose he just became more and more abandoned. When you reach a certain stage, then you've done this, that and the other. You either go to India or you go to New York, I don't know. <laughs>
In America, you could do a lot more. They had the heavy S&M clubs. They had all the leather. Everything's there. See, Freddie had this group of friends, his daughters in New York. And every Friday, it was my job to go and get the drugs for the, for the weekend, basically. But by the mid-80s, Freddie was growing tired of his hedonistic lifestyle. Sure, there comes a time when you, you want to share your life with someone one day. Yes, but nobody wants to share their life with me. That's a... Yes, I do, of course I do. Of course I do, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's not easy living with me. And uh, I, think, I think at the moment, uh, maybe I'm trying too hard. At the time, I think Freddie was getting to a, a stage in his life where he said, no, you know, it's time I settle down. Wanna be loved by you, just you, and nobody else but. Ah! Not over my face, thank you very much. I, I, I ah! may have come along at the right time for him. I fell in love with him, and that, that, that was the difference. And I firmly believe he fell madly in love with me as well. <laughs> but by this stage, unbeknownst to Freddie, he was living with a death sentence. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. Freddie found out in 1987 that he was sick. He had a mark on, the, on his shoulder and it, 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 it was for a biopsy. And of course, the results, he told me then the results came back. He said, I'm HIV positive. I've got AIDS, darling. He then said to me that, you know, if you want to leave, I'll understand. And I think that, that was also possibly the first time I actually said, I love you, Freddie. I'm not going anywhere. We were very depressed. We knew he was very ill, and um, it was just, we felt very sad and sorry for our friend. The most difficult situation was for me when I realised Freddie had actually got AIDS. And uh, I knew Fleet Street was trying to find out. I mean, uh, I didn't, for a moment, want to betray him, and I didn't. I wouldn't do that. How, how has the, the AIDS thing affected you? Well, I, I, this, I've stopped going out or whatever, and to be honest, I, I tell you, I, I've, I've almost become a nun. And, and you did actually take a test yourself, and you advised yes, no, that, don't you? Yes, no, 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 Yes, I'm fine. I'm having a good You're time. fine? Yes. Good. Yeah. I did suspect he had AIDS, but I didn't want to ask a dying man that question. So I just waited to see if he wanted to tell me that. And one day when we were visiting him in his bedroom, I saw his uh, foot was very badly scarred. And uh, I think he just chose that quiet moment to say, look, my dear, you must know that I'm dying. And that's all he said, and we just accepted it. Sometimes I get to feel I was back in the old days, long ago. When we were kids, when we were young, things seemed so perfect, you know. The minute he died, of course, I was upset, but also I was relieved. Um, he didn't have to go through pain anymore. He, you know, he was in constant pain. He never mentioned it, he never talked about it, but he was in constant pain. I handled it, but I handled it in my own way. And my way was to keep myself busy. I buried myself in the garden, doing little things. I, I actually couldn't handle it. It didn't register until I saw the articles. I can remember now, me reading with my dad, his tears and my tears, 
dropping tears on the on the newspaper article. Freddie Mercury died in November 1991 at the age of 45. His legacy and influence were to live on. 15 years after Freddie Mercury's death, his legacy lives on around the world. My name is Michael. I am in a Queen tribute band called Princess. I've been singing Freddie's songs for 10 years. I'm doing my best, but Freddie was unique. His voice, his charisma, his interaction with the audience. He will never be forgotten, and his music will live forever. The first time I remember Freddie, intrinsically inside me somewhere, I must have gone, that's what a pop star looks like, that's what a performer looks like. And ever since, I've been doing a mild imitation of Freddie. Freddie is somebody that I've adopted on stage to get me through a performance. Impersonation, you know, it's the highest form of flattery, I suppose. He loved opera very much, and he loved rock very much, and he was a great musician. And he wanted to mix them. Many audiences from the opera, suddenly, they like rock now. And many from the rock, they like opera. And I think that is one of his greatest achievements. When you hear his music on the radio and see him, I like to say to myself, people still love him and think of him, so that keeps me going. Think of him every day. Every day. Yes. Did I miss him? Hugely. Sorry. <coughs> I miss his fun, his, uh, his terrific brain, and his lust for life, you know. Freddie throwing his head back, laughing, and not caring if anybody saw his teeth. Do you think you're going to get to heaven? No, I don't want to. You don't want to? No, hell's much better. <laughs> Look at the inter interesting people that you're going to meet down there. <laughs> you're going to be there too, you know. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> Freddie, if you are out there and you want to choose any artist to channel your work, please give me an album, you know. Or, you know, or at worst, a middle eight, anything. I want your Harlequin suit, because I would like to wear that. And you are a genius, sir. We're sorry for ruining one of your songs, Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope we're keeping your legacy alive, mate. <laughs> I love you, Freddie. I hope to see you very soon. If he's watching, I tell him we miss him, and we all love him, and we remember him, and be God with him, be safe.